Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stefan Norgard. I'm a PhD student here in Columbia's Urban Planning Program at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, GSAP. And today I will be moderating a lecture in Urban Planning Series uh, LIPS panel event. This week, we are joined by four practitioners and public leaders in the field of urban social change. Their work spans sectors from municipal government, philanthropy, research institutes, and academia to international organizations. And notably, all four of our speakers have worked in philanthropy. And today we will discuss and consider uh, the historical and contemporary role of foundations in making and supporting social change in cities. Specifically, uh, we're joined in alphabetical order by, uh, and you guys can maybe wave as I, as I call you out, uh, Clarissa Bencomo, Don Chen, George Mack McCarthy, and uh, Maria Torres Springer. Uh, Clarissa Bencomo is an assistant professor at Columbia GSAP and an independent consultant on human rights, governance, and philanthropy. Don Chen is the president of the CERDNA Foundation. Uh, George Mack McCarthy is the president and CEO of the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, Maria Torres Springer is vice president for US programs at the Ford Foundation. In this conversation, we will discuss how philanthropies have had a long history of engagement with cities in the US and globally in urban development, city planning and visioning, and civic participation. Uh, we will discuss professional pathways and career opportunities that support justice, uh, social justice in cities. Um, and our panelists will also reflect on several current challenges, including the future of cities and urban life in the context of COVID-19, and ways that urban development organizations can support the advancement of racial justice. So I'll start with a few technical and logistical announcements and then uh, introduce our speakers and, and then we'll get started. So during the talk, I'd like to remind everyone to please mute your microphones. Uh, we will be recording today's lecture. So anyone in the audience who wishes not to be recorded should also please turn off your video input. Uh, the chat box should be used only for substantive discussion regarding the session. But if you have technical questions that apply only to you, please message myself or my colleague, Jenna Davis. You can do so privately in the chat and we'll try to resolve that. Uh, and finally, we encourage all of you to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. Jenna and I will be moderating them and, and taking a look. And then after the presentation, we'll have time for a brief Q&A. Uh, we will be coordinating the Q&A around 2 or, or 2.10 2 p.m. And we'll do so with an attention to diversity and inclusion. Uh, and if you've already had a chance to pose a question, uh, please allow others to do so before asking a second question. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce today's panelists. Uh, Clarissa Bencomo is an independent consultant on human rights, governance, and philanthropy. She's currently advising Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health on research and donor-funded programming to, ingest, to address gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health, and is taught in the university's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. From 2010 to 2018, she developed and led governance programming for the Ford Foundation's MENA office, Middle East and North Africa office in Cairo, um, and um, address spatial inequality, research and capacity building for service provision and documentation and advocacy for urban policies that are inclusive for migrants and refugees. Uh, she's had a long career uh, before that working as a researcher at Human Rights Watch based in Cairo in New York, among other institutions. Don Chen is the president of the CERDNA Foundation where he leads the 100 year old foundation's efforts to strengthen and further it, uh, its commitments to social justice. Prior to his appointment, Don was director of cities and states at the Ford Foundation, where his work supported urban development initiatives to make housing more affordable, promote more equitable land use practices, and empower communities to have a more powerful decision-making voice in American cities and in developing countries. Previously, Don was the founder and CEO of Smart Growth America. He led efforts to create the National Vacant Properties Campaign, which later became the Center for Community Progress and Transportation for America, and managed a merger with the Growth Management Leadership Alliance. Uh, Mac, is president and CEO of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Uh, he joined the Lincoln Institute in 2014 uh, from the Ford Foundation, where he previously directed programming in the Metropolitan Opportunity Unit. Mac joined Ford in 2000 from the Center for Urban and Regional Studies at the University of North Carolina, UNC. And his work experience includes professor, professor of economics at Bard College, uh, a resident scholar at the Levy Economics Institute, visiting scholar and member of the High Table, and research associate uh, for the Center for Social Research in St. Petersburg, Russia. And Maria Torres Springer is vice president for US programs at the Ford Foundation. She oversees all of the foundation's domestic programming for civic engagement in government, creativity and free expression, gender, racial and ethnic justice, uh, future of work, future of workers, just city of regions, uh, just cities and regions and technology and society. 
Maria's extensive experience includes almost 15 years in public service with the city of New York, where she led three agencies addressing some of the city's most significant public policy challenges, such as housing affordability, economic development, and workforce development. And throughout her tenure in the public sector and in previous roles in the nonprofit and private sectors, she has worked to create powerful partnerships among communities, business, and government in pursuit of expanded economic opportunity and justice for the historically marginalized. So we've got quite an esteemed panel, as you can all tell. And uh, let's get started with some questions. Why don't we start uh, with you, Don? Uh, what roles would you say foundations have played historically in urban planning and city building efforts uh, in the past, in the American context? And how would you say these roles have changed in more recent decades? Thanks, Stefan. And uh, I'm going to go with your uh, uh, suggestion that we try to keep our remarks to about three minutes each uh, with these questions. And I also want to just thank you for organi organizing us. Um, we all have a connection to the Ford Foundation because um, most of us met there and uh, we all work there. And uh, so it's just a delight to be uh, with, with all of you today. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about a couple things. Uh, I want to acknowledge first that uh, there are a vast array of activities that foundations have supported in these fields, urban planning, urban development, so on. It, it all goes back practically to the beginning of uh, the formal field of, uh, of urban planning and even of philanthropy, but I'm, I'm going to primarily focus on the ones that I'm most familiar with uh, through my career. Um, and I'll acknowledge that um, uh, you know, uh, just to highlight some examples, um, in the in the 50s and 60s, the Ford Foundation was involved in uh, supporting cities in the global south to develop uh, what were called basic development plans. They're, they were regional development plans um, in places like Calcutta and Delhi, uh, Calcutta now Kolkata, uh, and um, and then of course later uh, in the 60s, 70s, and beyond the community development movement. Um, but uh, the one I'm going to uh, talk about primarily is the uh, something that emerged with strength in the 90s and, and 2000s, and that was the transportation reform movement uh, and the smart growth movement. Uh, I was very involved in, in both of those. Um, and the transportation reform movement, it sounds about as unsexy as you can imagine, but it really came out of, uh, in part, uh, a combination, a confluence of different movements. There was a civil rights uh, movement in which uh, a lot of uh, local leaders, civil rights leaders like Marion Barry and various other folks in the, in the 60s um, rose to prominence by opposing urban renewal, highways going through black neighborhoods uh, and, and many types of developments like that. Um, and uh, uh, also environmentalists uh, opposing road construction. Um, here's a uh, an example of that. I don't know if you can see that on my camera, but uh, maybe if I hold it to my face, you know, end of the road was like a citizen's guide against overbuilding highways back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and, uh, and those were mainly led by environmentalists. And so there was a confluence in the 90s uh, to re literally rewrite the federal law, um, the, the coalition that came together. Um, funded by foundations like the Serdna Foundation and, and many others, uh, wrote uh, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991, uh, uh, otherwise known as ICE-T, and that spawned a whole uh, broad coalition building effort, multiple disciplines. Uh, it also birthed uh, what we call now the Smart Growth Movement, uh, where you had transportation folks uh, social equity advocates, housing advocates, uh, those basically who care about urban planning uh, to try to reform the way in which America's communities grow. Back then we called it social equity. Um, Angela Blackwell uh, of PolicyLink was one of the founding board members and equity was the watchword. Um, and now uh, we, we, we in the field tend to talk more about social justice. Um, but I think it really spawned uh, increasing efforts to try to get more uh, grassroots communities, community leaders involved in urban planning from the bottom up uh, through coalition buildings and various things. And I'll just to kind of tie the things together. This was a publication that we produced. You can't see it really called Choosing Our Community's Future, a Citizen's Guide to Getting the Most Out of Development. And uh, that was published by SGA back then. So um, those are a couple of ways in which uh, foundations have been involved. Um, and last thing I'll say here is uh, I think 
it's hard to really characterize, generalize the trends, but I think in the 20th century, there was a lot of effort among foundations to pilot and scale uh, with the assumption that government would do a lot of the scaling. Uh, and then there were private public partnerships like we saw a lot of during the community development era. Um, and then with the smart growth and transportation reform movements, um, funders really tried to orchestrate uh, activities and build ecosystems, coalitions of groups that could work together and then more recently, um, our focus has been to try to focus on building the strength of local organizations and local leaders because they're most familiar with the challenges that they're, that they're facing. And um, uh, those are those are the types of organizations that often get overlooked uh, by foundations because they tend to be small and very uh, community based. And I'll pause there. Thanks. Anyone else have thoughts on how foundations have supported either the field of urban planning or specific urban development or urban planning initiatives in the past and in, in the present? Well, I'll just say that, um, you know, the, some of the stuff that Don alluded to was, um, uh, you know, reflecting on uh, the efforts of philanthropy, particularly the Ford Foundation and some of the larger uh, uh, national foundations to actually build a field of practice. The community development field really didn't exist before um, uh, the foundations got together and decided that they were going to find a way to create a new institutional structure that was going to um, become a bridge for um, capital and other uh, forms of uh, support to underserved neighborhoods and cities. And, um, and that, that was an effort that really took place over about three decades. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, a hit and run kind of thing. It was a, it was a deliberate, um, you know, um, political, economic, and philanthropic effort that I, I would say had an indelible uh, impact on the on the uh, way cities have grown and, uh, in some cases, prospered, and in other cases, not prospered. Um, but um, really, it, it's a signature piece of work from philanthropy that you can't um, uh, you can't ignore. Yeah, thanks, Mac. And, um, you know, Clarissa, we, we were talking a bit about the American context, but what about the, the global context? Would you say there have been historical differences between foundation support of planning efforts in the United States and in other countries or, or global South countries, as they're sometimes called these days? Well, for better or worse, there are a lot of similarities. Um, I think but the general trend has been very similar to the trends in international development thinking. So as Don pointed out, you know, things start off very much technically focused and focused on funding government. So 50s, 60s, 70s are really about um, support for technical advisors, seconding people, setting up legal and policy frameworks, um, production of experts through creating schools of urban planning, um, funding higher education, those sorts of things. Um, you don't get the same shift in kind of participatory work that you get in the US until later, which I think also speaks to the fact that foundations for the most part were US based and didn't have a broad geographical footprint. So even though Ford, for example, had a large number of offices, didn't lo localize its um, program staff until quite late. And I think for that level of engagement, you really need to have people embedded in the country who understand and are from the country that they're working in. And that came late for, or didn't come at all for many US foundations. Uh, 80s and 90s, you see a greater emphasis on uh, civic engagement, participation, human rights, democratic participation, um, which has its parallel to the US, but it's really about building civil society capacity to demand rights, strategic litigation starts up. Um, Stefan, you, you know the South Africa context, that's kind of one place where it all comes to together, right? Um, so foundation support for civil society and government to try to shift and address the legacy of, of um, spatial inequality from anti-apartheid period, from the apartheid period, 
um, 2000s, 2010s are really a shift to place-based approaches, multi-country networks, networks that include the US. Um, this is where you get the shift to participatory budgeting, right to the city, movement building. Um, foundations supported a lot of national and cross, multinational cross-country uh, learning and mobil mobilization platforms, things like Logo Link, uh, Communitas Coalition, um, the lead up to the MDGs and the SDGs and Habitat 3, really a lot of support for helping people connect and mobilize across those types of issues and, and advocate around them, um, but also interdisciplinary approaches and networks. So. You see with Ford and with Mellon, um, bringing in the arts, um, bringing in anthropology, social science, um, just trying to come at the issue from different angles. Um, also, especially in the 210s, addressing urban refugees, uh, the Syrian crisis, you get Ford coming in on these issues, OSF, it's networks of mayors, trying to figure out how that works in place. And interestingly, kind of a new throwback to an older era of funding the production of experts. So this is also where you get a support for new kinds of urban planning expertise and experts. So uh, what does a Southern lad vision of urban planning look like? So support for the Indian Institute of Human Settlements, African Center for Cities, those types of groups. Um, and what does, what does that look like and how does that shift how we understand planning and planning approaches? We can talk uh, later on, on on what that looks like, but uh, Don led the, uh, Ford led the push on this with the, a multi-country initiative called Just Cities that programmed um, across social, political, economic, um, entry points with very much a human rights-based approach in multiple countries. Um, Mellon had its architecture and urbanism and humanities initiative also started around 2012. Rockefeller did a little bit of a throwback with its, um, with its 100 resilient cities. They went back to the older model of putting a resilience expert in government. Um, and then had to readjust when they kind of rediscovered what we had learned the first time in the 50s and 60s about some of those limitations. But I think for a lot of it, for foundations, it's always a back and forth between uh, how you engage with private sector, civil society, residents, um, government, and what's the right balance because none of those does it on its own. Yeah, thanks, Clarissa. And um, me, let's let's turn to Mac now. Um, what would you say some of the concerns or the uh, undersides of some of these historical or ongoing efforts have been? Both the the concerns of philanthropic overreach, for example, by elected officials in in the 1950s and 60s, um, or uh, concerns today about the relationship between philanthropy and, and democracy. Would you say that these have also extended to the urban development and urban planning uh, fields and sectors? Oh, absolutely. So um, am I muted? No, let's see. No, good. So um, yeah, so, so Stefan, the, the, um, really the, the effort to regulate foundations actually came from um, an effort in Cleveland where um, I think they call the gray areas program of the Ford Foundation completely overreached and it became kind of a shadow uh, local government and it, and it ended up calling forth congressional kind of uh, scrutiny. And it became the last time really any kind of real regulatory influence was imposed on philanthropy where um, they, they limited the kind of activities that philanthropy could do. And they also um, required that philanthropy would do a minimum kinds of activities like spend a minimum amount of their endowments. That was the, you know, the basis of most of the critique of philanthropic efforts fall into I don't know, two or three different categories. One of them is a lack of accountability, right? I mean, the, uh, philanthropy really isn't accountable to anybody except to the IRS. Uh, 
And the IRS is not a very good regulator. It only makes sure that you spend enough money every year. Um, and it's not accountable to either its grantees nor uh, the places that it works. And so the biggest critique from local governments is that uh, philanthropy can come in and set up its own kind of shadow uh, power structure that then becomes either um, uh, an aid or a problem depending on its orientation to local government. Um, the other thing that, uh, the other critique is um, uh, kind of, I, I would say most of the critiques are well-founded by the way, having uh, lived through both sides of this. The, um, the delusions of grandeur that, that philanthropy brings, because um, philanthropy wields what seem to be considerable resources, but really pale in comparison to the resources that the public sector wields. And so somehow philanthropy thinks that, so for them to throw millions of dollars at a problem will then somehow call forth billions of dollars of, of public money because the, the whatever things they demonstrate on the ground are gonna be that smart. Uh, Don kind of alluded to that when he talked about the idea that philanthropy will pilot something and then hand it off to local government to bring it to scale. But local government doesn't always feel like bringing things to scale that were invented or devised by philanthropists who might or might not have kind of the best ideas uh, in mind. And then the last critique is really, you know, the other one about philanthropy is that philanthropy in general tends to have ADD, right? A lot of fascination with new shiny objects, uh, um, the, the tendency to, to flip from idea to idea, um, no real commitment uh, long-term in any particular uh, place. And then philanthropy will just change course on a dime and they leave lots of places kind of hanging. So uh, recently over the last, let's say five or 10 years, almost all of the big philanthropy in the United States uh, decided to stop funding housing work. Uh, they're gonna come back to housing now that housing has become such a crisis issue, but MacArthur, Ford, uh, most of the big uh, philanthropy decided they were gonna just look, go in a different place. Uh, most of the philanthropy just uh, gave up on rural uh, work about 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, most philanthropy in, in the U.S. now is not really doing anything that's place-based, but is doing what they call people-based philanthropy, which is a little bit more abstract and sometimes harder to connect to the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So I would say those are the kind of the, the main uh, areas of, of critique. And it's something that I think, you know, philanthropy should take a little bit more seriously, but um, Rarely does that happen, right? Thanks, Mac. And yeah, I mean, given those uh, past and ongoing uh, concerns or, or criticisms, I'd love to bring uh, Maria in here now. Um, and especially since you're now the current vice president uh, of um, the, the Ford Foundation's uh, work on US programs. Uh, Maria, how would you say the foundation is working in cities today? And would you say the Ford Foundation has kind of learned from the past in developing its current grant making strategy? Thank you. I'd be happy to lend a couple of perspectives to uh, what's a terrific conversation. I think it's a little bit of a Ford reunion here. And so I appreciate in particular Clarissa bringing in a lot of um, the voices and perspectives and approaches of other foundations. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, those on this call might be getting a little bit of a skewed view of um, the role of philanthropy, but we'll, we'll try our best. Um, I wanted to focus on a couple of, of areas uh, with regards to how at least Ford works in cities that might be relevant to this discussion. First, uh, how we view cities and certainly many other funders as both venues and vehicles for, for social change. Of course, it's often been said, right, that cities are the frontline laboratories of democracy and that they need to be both recognized and be held responsible for their roles in upholding the essential principles of and strengthening democracy. And they can either lead by example or by opposition. And so there's, there's a lot of agency that cities have um, in, um, in a functioning democracy. The second thing is that, you know, we've been of course quite focused on uh, combating the, the, the roots of, of inequality and perhaps um, inequality is most visible in cities given that the top 1% and those at the bottom of the income spectrum 
um, live so closely together. And so what that means are that the actors on the city level, policymakers, activists, I mean, everyone in between, that there's a, a very important and acute and direct set of conversations, policy debates about inequality. And so right now, for instance, in a number of cities, um, policy issues running the gamut from housing to economic justice and the role and, um, and the role of workers, um, given the, the recovery, criminal justice. I know hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit later about what equitable recovery might look like in place given the state of the world today. So these are all policy discussions that happen in ways that mean something to real human beings in cities. And both those actors, including philanthropy, um, I think has, when we do our jobs well, there is support that can be provided in order to um, advance those issues in ways that actually improve people's lives. Um, the, the other thing that I'll say is that um, at Ford, you know, one of the things that has evolved and, and we're in the middle of this, so um, th there's been some good progress, but so much of this work has a, a much longer arc. Um, that part of the recognition of what does it mean to have impact in cities is that cities don't exist in isolation, that they are part of regional and state formations that, are, um, that have to be tended to in order for the issues and policy um, uh, concerns of cities um, are actually, can actually get affected and impacted. So as an example of that, um, right after the 2016 election, for instance, we, we made a shift and you know, Don led so much um, of this work. Um, and a re this was a real evolution in our place-based programming where we started looking um, beyond cities. So including, but not limited to cities and looked at states. And so the, the, a city's role in a, um, in a larger geographic area to, in order to advance the type of issues that matter most to people, all the, the policy areas that I mentioned before, but then you include voting rights and reproductive rights and more on criminal justice. I mean, these, these are wins that can be achieved at the state level, but what that would, what requires then is really supporting and building out the type of civic infrastructure that allows organizations to actually be in relationship to work together and to do that not just in these episodic moments of campaigns or elections, but over a longer stretch in order to actually achieve those wins. So this was a pivot that we made in, in, in six different states, Minnesota, Michigan, New York, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. And I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that because there is, I think, as with all philanthropic institutions, the, the role of geography as strategy is one that I think necessarily has to adapt and that we need to, we have been confronting and need to continue to confront the fact that um, so much of what it means to push for and achieve the changes that a lot of the partners that we work with are, are hoping for ultimately is about power. And so I know hopefully we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but that has really affected not just who we fund, but, but how we fund. And, and I think those are changes that will be for the better over the long run. I'll stop there. Great. And uh, Don, you're president at CERDA Foundation. How would you say your strategy uh, is different from, is similar to uh, the strategy at the Ford Foundation there? Um, well, thanks for that question. Um, you know, all foundations are uh, distinct. Um, I would say ours is uh, um, distinct from a lot of other foundations in that we we have learned a lot of tough lessons. Um, you know, many of the comments from our previous speakers are really about, um, you know, how foundations have thought that they could do a lot, uh, came in uh, with some money um, and some ideas uh, and then learn some tough lessons. And I, I would just reflect on uh, Cerdna's experience. Uh, you know, we had a, um, 
uh, Hooper Brooks, who uh, was at the Regional Plan Association, um, you know, so very much coming from the planning field um, and supported, as I said, the transportation reform movement, uh, smart growth and various things. And I think so much of that work um, was very impactful, very rich, uh, but I think two important lessons that we learned along the way um, were, and this would expand on what Max said earlier, um, I think across the field, uh, there was an underestimation of just how much money uh, is out there to influence urban development uh, and the fact that foundations really, you know, need to take that into account uh, when we want to influence things or want to support uh, organizations uh, to have that influence. Um, and the other major thing that I think we underestimated was the political influence. Um, so nowadays, when I think about the work that we're doing, you know, I think about uh, these questions about like who, you know, if you're trying to change um, the dynamics of development in a place to really benefit communities, especially um, communities of color, low income communities, uh, the key question is like, who owns all the property? Who owns, you know, as Saskia Sassen often says, who owns the city? Um, uh, and th that's very hard to find out generally. Uh, and who are the power brokers who have has the influence um so out of that experience one thing that we really try to focus on a lot is uh, how to build uh political influence um really strengthen organizations uh you know for their own sake not for some kind of set of goals that are just uh held at foundations but really um, be a good partner uh, with community-based organizations and to help them organize and network across the country and even across the globe. Um, uh, some of the activists call that translocal organizing. Um, and then the development of expertise within and with communities. I know that a lot of scholars from uh, places like Columbia work with community-based organizations. Actually, I, I dug up this book uh, from Jason Corburn, who used to be an assistant professor at Columbia street science is one of the first this is like from 20 years ago he was one of the first scholars that i encountered uh in my career who really put a lot of emphasis on uh the importance of local expertise and the fact that um you know uh people who have day jobs uh you know can develop a really sophisticated understanding of the planning process and and um uh that you know that's an important thing for them to have a voice in decision making so um, that's been an exciting thing. So that's the way in which we've learned a lot, just in terms of the differences with Ford. I mean, Ford is way bigger. So um, as a medium-sized foundation, um, uh, we really try to uh, get our dollars uh, to go as far as possible, not just in grant making, but also in our impact investing, where we take our dollars from our uh, endowment uh, and try to leverage the heck out of, you know, whatever we can and, and leverage, uh, you know, private capital and other uh, other money uh, to have an impact in uh, these types of areas. I think for really large, you know, one of the largest foundations for it, it's, uh, it's easier uh, to do that and have a huge influence in the sector. For a medium-sized foundation like us, it's, uh, we have to just be very strategic about how to deploy our funds because uh, we just have less of it. Great. And Mac, over at the Lincoln Institute uh, for Land Policy, uh, what is your organization thinking um, about urban development and urban planning right now? And how does your organization both work with and sometimes push back against philanthropic organizations? Uh, yeah, so, so Stefan, so we're what we call a private operating foundation. So we work with, we have an endowment, but we're not allowed to make grants. We have to actually run programs. And so, Part of our work is to figure out the right kind of programs to be run. But just to back up for a second, you know, the thing is um, about philanthropy, I think that, you know, something we should all appreciate is that um, if we look at the world as at three big sectors, right? The public sector, the private sector, and the civic sector, philanthropy at its best um, would, should be fortifying the civic sector to kind of ride herd on the on the public sector and the private sector to make sure that they're doing their jobs in a, in a nice checks and balances kind of way. But over the course of the last 40 or 50 years, we've seen the private sector become so powerful that it's really overwhelmed both the civic sector and the public sector. And the capacity 
say the public sector has been diminished so uh, severely that we think it's time to find ways to fortify the public sector again. Because when, when it, you know, when it all comes down to, you know, basics, the quality of life for most people is delivered by their local government. And even though we obsess about things that orange creatures do on Twitter at midnight, um, what we actually find out is that um, the local government is the thing that makes sure that you get your uh, clean water delivered or not if you live in Flint. You know, make sure you have roads and you have all the other infrastructure that makes your life livable. And most people can't even pick out their local government from a, a lineup if they were asked to, right? So for us, we've decided that um, our job, at least for now, is to fortify the capacities of local governments to do the work that needs to be done to make people's lives livable and better, right? And that means to be able to provide them with new tools, new training, new approaches to being able to do things, including the, the creation of new kind of um, uh, tables or, or coalitions of organizations of people that think differently about how you make your local uh, city or your, your local metro region work better, right? And um, part of that is hoping to connect those different places that are working in different ways with each other to become you know, self-supporting kind of networks. And that sounds all pretty abstract, but it, you know, it comes down to some pretty basic things like how do you help local government to find the revenue they need to actually pay for the services uh, that they're gonna deliver or to invest in the infrastructure they need to deliver those services. And we help them find new uh, land-based um, revenues from land value capture, from doing a better job of collecting the property tax and also doing a better job of managing and planning how they spend that money. Uh, we find ways to get, you know, planners better training and better support. And we uh, find ways to use all of our expert networks to kind of fortify each other. So that's basically our approach. And it's, it's, it's place-based, but it's based in, it's, it's focused on themes of activities that really end up resulting in higher levels of capacity, particularly for local governments. Fantastic. Thanks. And, um... Clarissa and, and uh, others as well. Um, what do you all think students at GSAP, whether in a professional master's program for urban planning or other programs at GSAP, what are some professional pathways or, or opportunities or, or things to do both personally and professionally to support social justice in cities? So, so some of the things that I would really want to emphasize are the things that go beyond GSAP. I mean, it's an intense program. People get really focused on getting through an intense workload and making the most of their time. But as has come up in this conversation, it's really also about educating yourself about the underlying systems that hamper social justice. Uh, so we know there are huge issues around financialization of housing, land, and property. We know there's systemic racism. We know there are all kinds of marginalization. What are the mechanisms and the intersectionalities that are affecting um, housing outcomes and planning outcomes? Um, who else can give you some insight into that? So. There are all these other disciplines that are really rich that you of. So, you know, be talking to folks in the arts, be talking to folks in the social sciences. You know, the some of the most interesting urban planners I know of in Egypt have also have degrees in anthropology. Uh, you know, the, the intersections can be really interesting and the, those conversations about what you're seeing from those different perspectives can be really rich. Um, I think another thing that we don't talk about enough in the US or globally is what does it mean to be a good ally? So what's an ethical partnership as you're going out into the field, whether as a planner or a researcher, can you commit to ethical, sustained partnerships in the communities where you want to have impact? Um, that means sharing resources and risks. That means supporting local leader leadership in the in 
design it means sharing credit for good outcomes. Organizations to sustain the do no harm principle because a lot of folks are going to end up in UN agencies or uh, corporations or government uh, being tasked with implementing projects that are going to be harmful and becoming more skilled in how to find internal allies and external allies to push back against those kinds of pressures. I think the other thing that often folks um, don't think enough about is the possibility to start up your own projects outside of these existing um, uh, systems and, and organizations. So architecture and urban planning in most of the world are really elite um, fields that draw people from elite backgrounds. Um, but there are often a lot of possibilities for working outside of the traditional prestigious um, places. So um, there have been in Egypt and Lebanon, for example, a whole number of small kind of think do tanks that have come up that are basically function as consultancies, but also get some grant money who are doing really innovative community based work. Um, they've been a, behind a lot of the, um, the response to the destruction in Beirut after the explosion and a lot of community based work those are sustainable at a scale and they can really actually have a significant input on, um, on projects and policies. So those are the kinds of things people to think about. Thanks, Clarissa. And if, do other folks have um, thoughts or ideas about, about that question, about personal or professional opportunities to support social justice in cities that, that you'd like to add? I'd love to add, Chris, so that was fantastic. A, a lot of really um, terrific um, advice um, into what you just shared. Um, I'll, I'll just plus one a couple of um, ideas that you mentioned, uh, but every, every potential opportunity, personal or professional in various sectors to really broaden the understanding of the work beyond the technical skills I would just seize because they're, and, and I say this as someone who worked in government for, for a long time, and it is, um, it, it is tempting to um, view the work as a series of, of technical things that have to happen in order to get a, a project or a set of projects done. And um, in the face of, um, accountability for better or for worse that in government looks like the a, a political cycle, a news cycle that um, it, without the experiences either yourself or uh, because you have been in relationship with communities and with people who are the most impacted or at the center of, of, of what needs to be changed, it is, it's just all too easy in my, um, in my view to fall back on the things that technically need to be done versus all of the work that is clearly kind of harder, more systemic um, that uh, need to be tackled. The second thing that I'll say is despite what I just said about, about city government is that it's all, I, I always, I um, encourage everyone to spend some time, doesn't have to be a long time um, in local government. And there's just nothing quite like um, having to confront what is needed in order to, um, if, you're, if you're doing the job properly, really deliver the type of service, the type of programs, the type of response from government that communities and people deserve. And so, um, but time spent in government, time spent with it, with, um, a civil society organization, an advocacy organization, all of these, of course, allow and more and more people are viewing, you know, this work as it, as it should be as interdisciplinary and that you're not just kind of in one place for a very long period of time, but it's that athlete, athleticism that I think allows us to be better um, 
interdisciplinary thinkers and ultimately better in the roles that we are in so that that you you are less at risk of caricaturing someone in a different sector or in a different role um, versus figuring out what it means to uh, work even though you might disagree on on specific tactics works to work towards a, um, a particular hopefully common vision Great. I would, Thank I, would you. Just, I would just yeah. add one other uh, quick thing. And uh, for planners, it would it's really useful to, to develop one specific tool, and that's um, a tool that allows you to map how power works in the places that you work. So power mapping tells you kind of the underlying structures and how decisions are actually made, and understanding that then gives you sometimes the uh, the tools you need to do to to circumvent these. Uh, power poles that will push people in in directions and very often are unaccountable and a lot of that power is uh, exhibited by developers and developers are notoriously not um, very transparent and they don't uh, have very much accountability to much uh, other than uh, shareholders and you got to be careful because uh, they're able to marshal lots and lots of political power and push people around but power mapping is such a fundamental thing and I think that it's rarely taught in planning schools. Thanks for everyone's comments. Uh, Don, do you want to weigh in or are you, uh, are you, are you set? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just say that in keeping with the power mapping theme, uh, you know, the other big influence is uh, capital, finance, uh, how the money works. Um, that is so critical. Um, I wish I had taken a, you know, municipal finance class in grad school, but had to learn all that stuff on the job. So that's uh, often, you know, not extremely opaque to uh, community uh, members. And uh, if you're going through a professional program, um, I'd say like, learn about how that part of the world works. Thanks. Thanks, just, to, thanks just to all to, our to add on, Just to add on that, there's a power link of the jargon for these other fields. So, um, and, and that's something that, that um, you know, be, being able to talk the language of a city official uh, in, to, get, to make your argument to them in their own language, understanding how they run their budgets, understanding all of those processes, really um, gets you an entree point that you wouldn't have otherwise. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely agree. And, and thanks for all that advice. Um, let's go with one final question and then open it up because it looks like we have a number of fantastic um, questions in the chat box. But I'm curious about how philanthropies and foundations, including private operating foundations, are thinking about uh, the current moment and the multiple crises and challenges of COVID and systemic racism and um, potential um, crises in democracy or elections administration. Um, maybe let's start with you, Maria. Um, how is philanthropy weighing in uh, in this intense moment uh, for American democracy and the economy and, and um, on racial justice? Yeah, no, well, it, it, you mentioned crises and it's, it's multiple crises. It's a cascade of crises. Um, there's no shortage of metaphors to, um, to describe what, uh, what we've been through uh, this past year. And that the, there are so many uh, moments that, that one could view as, as a kind of watershed, but you know, I have to say that the murder of George Floyd, which is one in a seemingly unbroken string of unjust deaths, unjust black deaths, in the hands of law enforcement was a, a moment that, that both of course made all of the, the, the crises economic and health related um, that compounded that, um, but in, in, in many ways also kind of brought to the fore and an even clearer way that what is needed, it's not just relief, it's not even just recovery, it is in many instances a full reimagining of a lot of the systems in which we operate. And so all of that is to say that very few institutions, certainly not philanthropy, 
in general uh, um, was really ready to confront that unanticipated multiple set of crises. So what that means is you kind of have to throw the rule book out. And that starts with the recognition that we don't have all the answers. It starts with the recognition that we don't have the current playbook. And so you have to do different things and you have to, and you have to do more. And that it has to be more than the, than the typical payout, for example, in a given year, and more than just the, the current set of grantees who you might be funding. And so for us, that has meant um, uh, really trying to utilize in our, in our case, um, the market by um, the issuance of a billion dollars worth of bonds in order to increase our payout this year and next year. For example, it also meant really shedding all of the stuff that philanthropy has created over time that just makes it hard for organizations that receive our funding to, to do what they do well. And so um, all, all of the flexibility that's needed, uh, doing more and more of multi-year general operating support, really trying to listen to grantees, all of that it has just been even more necessary. And I think you're seeing the field do more and more of that. And that has been terrific. In terms of, of, of some of the policy areas, I, I thought I'd just name a couple that I, that I think are, um, are pretty critical. One is the, um, the commitment to the types of organizations, racial justice organizations, who are at the front lines of, of this work. And I think what we saw, with the protests from Minneapolis across the city, it really across the globe, that was a collective people taking to the streets in a collective expression of grief and frustration. And so, but these are the organizations who are powering the transformation. And so philanthropy's ability to fund those types of organizations, in particular, black led organizations, BIPOC led organizations, we think is just really critical to making sure that those protests lead to structural change. And the, the last thing that I'll say, which is part of what it means not just to recover, but to reimagine, is to make sure that we learn from um, disasters, both natural and man-made of the past, and ensure that as many cities, states, constellations of actors put forward and try to implement their various recovery plans that we avoid those things that meant in the past, certain people recovered, certain communities recovered, but too often the same communities that have always been left behind continue to be left behind either in a pandemic scenario or in a, in a growth scenario. So those, so we're, we're, those are a couple of areas that we're really squarely focused on. Um, at Ford, and um, obviously there's a the there's no shortage of ways that we need to support the organizations that are at the front lines. But it certainly starts with with us being as honest and, and humble as possible about um, about what philanthropy can can do in this moment. Great, thank you. Um, just being mindful of the clock, why don't we? Uh, move to some questions and I think we'll have some opportunities to continue engagement on this question of the current moment and um, philanthropy's role in it. Um, Drashti, you mentioned you have a, a spoken question. Why don't you go ahead and ask the panelists uh, your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for all the panelists for, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, as a daughter of working class immigrants, I, I am particularly interested in, in developing that collaboration between local governments, communities, officials, and philanthropies to, to really address the, the really complex problems we have at this time. And philanthropy appeals to me because it's not bound by these democratic or, or sorry, bureaucratic rules or, or the tendency to shy away from innovation. But at the same time, it scares me to, to think that big donors can shape the ways policies are perceived. You know, don't get me wrong, I love the work of foundations like Ford Foundation. But if we zoom out, we see that at the end of the day, it is big donors and, and typically old white men who, who set the priorities, even if there's a diverse range of employees carrying out the operations and program visions. It also makes me think about 
how philanthropies may, may take away resources from governments who could have taxed donors' wealth for services instead of creating foundations. So I guess, what would you say to me to, to convince me, to convince people like me, young progressive people, that philanthropy is a just, is a viable structural avenue for change? Thank you. That's not an easy one to answer, uh, by the way. But you know, what's interesting about that is that the, the, what most people don't appreciate about philanthropy is that philanthropy is playing with public money. And uh, everybody acts as if it's some kind of beneficence of some donor, some rich white guy that created all this money. And it, it, it actually is the tax structure and it's the, um, it's, it's the regulatory structure that basically allows philanthropy to exist and to do the things they do with as little accountability as they have, but you're right. It's it's a, it's not a democratic institution at all. And it and it and if if there's anything out crying out for reform, I think it probably is philanthropy because people don't appreciate the extent to which the economic benefits of putting money away for particular purposes um, are actually completely outweigh kind of what the money could be used for otherwise if it were in the hands of the uh, the government. And one of the worst kind of interpretations of what philanthropy is is, is, is saying we're smarter than the public sector and we'll take this money and use it better than the public sector, even if uh, you know, we're not accountable. And, that, and in, in many cases, and I'm, I'm, I'm being overly critical because frankly, the best people I've ever worked with in my life, I work with at the Ford Foundation. And they came and they were committed and they did, they, they wanted to pursue these ideals, right? But they also, you know, you gotta understand that big philanthropy like the Ford Foundation is only the tip of the iceberg of philanthropy. There's 60,000 foundations in the United States, 40,000 of whom have no employees, right? And, and, and forget about donor advised funds, right? That sit there and have no requirements for how that money is spent. So in many ways, the inequality that created philanthropy is perpetuated by philanthropy and it doesn't necessarily undo all the problems that were you know, created as part of it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go. You need to go to philanthropy to help philanthropy to be better, right? And we need to continue to push to make it do the work that it should be doing as opposed to the work that it doesn't do while all this money sits on the sidelines. So, I mean, it's, it really is a tough question. And I would say that, um, you know, the real object of our scrutiny shouldn't be big philanthropy like Ford. It should be all those billions and billions of dollars sitting idle in donor advised funds um, with no requirement to do anything, right? So um, if we could figure out a way to, to leverage that money, a lot more could happen and, and the right kinds of things would happen, right? Um, I would just Both add and, Mac, both and. <laughs> Not transparency for both. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Yeah, I, I also think it's a great question and I, I like Mac's advice. You know, I think uh, like Maria said, um, in addition to going into public service uh, in the public sector, going into philanthropy to see how it works and also uh, really trying to uh, have an influence on the expectations and accountability uh, that we as society have on that sector is really critical. Um, I think it all does boil down to this question of accountability. Um, philanthropy is just about the most unaccountable sector in American society. I mean, I'm hard pressed to think of another one that has less accountability mechanisms uh, in place governing it. Um, and at least within the part of philanthropy that I sit in, which is really social justice and racial justice philanthropy, um, I think a lot of a lot of us, the people that we work with most closely are, you know, pretty self-aware about those unequal uh, dynamics. And, you know, like I, I would uh, be in favor of uh, congressional oversight that's different, you know, requiring more payout, for example, more transparency measures. But, um, you know, that is something that, uh, well, I think the good thing is that uh, we see in the last, you know, five to 10 years, much more uh, scrutiny, uh, a lot more uh, critics, authors, um, various folks really shining a light on philanthropy, and they're unafraid, uh, because frankly, philanthropy has this power of being able to dish out lots of money and therefore kind of uh, doesn't encourage tons of uh, free public debate on this topic. But um, I would like to see much more robust debate on that front. Um, uh, 
from an urban planning standpoint, uh, one thing that I just really um, learned about uh, when overseeing our, our work on climate change in, um, uh, and worked with indigenous people's communities in places like Brazil and others is this notion of FPIC, free prior and informed consent. Uh, it's a, it's a, basically a, a set of measures or a principle that um, you know, any major donor, like a, you know, whether it's a, a you know, a sovereign wealth fund or a, you know, aid agency or a foundation uh, or, you know, a, a big corporation or, or whatnot should not come into a community without uh, the community's say so. Uh, the free prior and informed consent of community groups. Um, I think that is a really important concept that we should bake into more uh, mechanisms by which uh, folks come in with big ideas and big money to uh, to create social change in communities. It's you know inherently like a top down um, non democratic idea to do that type of thing. Um, so so I, I appreciate your your question. Um, there are a lot of challenges within the sector and. I think a, a, a number of us are really trying to grapple with those um, in the moment. Thanks. Uh, to add to that, as someone who's done a lot of programming globally, I think part of what's also to keep in important to keep in mind is not to assume that government is efficient and effective for everyone. So part of the role that I see for philanthropy is, um, is power building for marginalized populations. And if you're not contributing to that, then I think you need to have a real second thought about, about um, what your role is. Um, but in, in much of the world, and certainly in the US as well, um, you can't count on political participation to get people what they want because the systems are so skewed. And if philanthropy, if philanthropic money is going to address that, that's a good thing. The, the accountability issues are still all there. Um, I think for me in my time at my almost nine years at Ford, one of the, one of the things that I feel the worst about was take on drivers of capitalism and, and really do more to take that apart. But I think the extent to which we can push money to empower and build movements for folks that otherwise don't have a voice in a political process, that's really important. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, we have a question earlier from Emily Jasser writing, I live in Cleveland. Um, I work in a neighborhood that's nearly downtown, but was severely harmed by redlining. Many of the buildings in this neighborhood are abandoned and in disrepair, while the community has had some strong community centers for youth. Uh, while it has some strong community centers for youth, it lacks key resources, such as a grocery store. Uh, and there's a fear that this area will be a target of gentrification due to its proximity to downtown. How can urban renewal projects use the space of abandoned buildings and improve the built community without contributing to gentrification and rising housing costs? Um, Emily, please feel free to, um, to comment on that. And um, Don, maybe we can start with you and then, and then move to Mac. Uh, this question of development without displacement, how uh, should we be thinking about it? And, uh, whether drawing on the case of Cleveland or more broadly. Uh, sure, this is a great classic question. It's an age old question. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go straight to, you know, a principle that I think is really critical. And that is um, uh, uh, to ensure that there's uh, ownership or some other kind, you know, mechanisms for control over what happens in the neighborhood is, is so critical. Uh, one thing I really learned from Mac and from uh, Clarissa and others that during my years at Ford, uh, was uh, that when community-based organizations, uh, community leaders, uh, local elected officials um, commit to an, uh, a number of mechanisms to have that control, um, then they can really try to ensure that development uh, serves the needs of, of people um, in those communities, rather than turn it over to like some, you know, free market process that, uh, that really doesn't have a, a connection to community, which unfortunately is is quite common. Um, uh, 
And so, uh, you know, all of that is very hard to do. Um, you know, gaining ownership and control over sites, uh, having a comprehensive community development strategy uh, to figure out how to deploy um, capital and also how to attract people to come in and actually do the types of development that you like to see is, is really hard. But there are a lot of great organizations that do it. And in fact, Cleveland has a great ecosystem of community development organizations, uh, like I think it's called Community Progress Inc., Neighborhood Progress Inc., um, and others that are that are very mature and sophisticated and effective. Um, and then the last thing I'll note is uh, there's a really, uh, it, it's really critically important to have vision, uh, a vision uh, for what your community wants to become uh, through a democratic process. So participatory visioning, planning processes are really uh, important so that the neighborhood, you can generate a critical mass of support behind where the community wants to go and then try to attract people to, to do it uh, and, and hopefully have that be a, you know, uh, a positive uh, thing for, for developers as, as well and more importantly for community members who would stand to benefit from those improvements. So the, the, the quick answer I would give is you got to get control of the land. I, this neighborhood sounds like Huff to me, so I don't know, maybe it's not Huff, but um, in any case, the, um, you know, the, the, the only mechanism I've seen that's had durability in terms of being able to uh, help to improve a place and to preserve community control is a community land trust. And they're not used as prominently as they should be, but if the community can get control of the land and, um, and use that model for both uh, community input into the decisions made about how it gets redeveloped and also finding ways to preserve affordability in other kinds of um, community serving aspects like making sure that you get the right kind of commercial development grocery stores instead of um, instead of liquor stores or check cashing stores right um, that that can work right and it, and it has worked in a, to a limited degree in places like uh, New Orleans and it's worked to a much greater degree in places like uh, Burlington, Vermont. Um, but the idea of being able to then execute a, a plan on land that the community controls is the bulwark against uh, you know, um, displacement. Um, you want economic development. You want even a little bit of gentrification if, you mean, if that means improvement of the land, improvement of the dwellings and all that. What you don't want is um, uh, people to be displaced um, unnecessarily or involuntarily, right? And in order to do that, you have to get the community to be part of that decision-making process and controlling the land is the easiest way to do it. And I don't know whether that, that's you know off the table in terms of the value of the land and the cost of doing it, but if there's public subsidy around, a lot of the land might have already reverted to public ownership and getting the public to convey it to a community land trust wouldn't be out of the question. So like right now we've been working with land banks that have been now moving land out of the land bank into a community land trust as a way to redevelop and control it. And you have a great land bank in Cuyahoga County. So that would be uh, the first place I would go to say, what do you got in our neighborhood? If it's not Hoff, it's probably one of those neighborhoods nearby anyway. So that's my thoughts. Thank you so much. It's actually, uh, it's not far from Hoff. It's just the, the central neighborhood where I'm serving. Oh, central, okay, yeah. Um, but the, the organization I'm with is, is also in the Huff neighborhood and some others. So thank you so much. Thanks. Anyone else on this question, Clarissa or, or Maria, or um, we can also move to some other questions from folks. Um, okay, great. Um, it, we have a question from Ranjani um, about uh, the work of uh, Anand Jirarad, Jirarahadas. Uh, on philanthropy and democracy and the role of philanthropy in preserving wealth concentration. I, sorry, I butchered that name. Um, Ranjani, are you with us still? And if so, would you like to, to elaborate on your question at all? Uh, hi, I think my question is quite concise. It's uh, Anand Giridharadas. Uh, he has written extensively on how um, you know, philanthropy, because I think people have already uh, sort of covered this. So I guess my question is kind of um, jumping off that, but like how it sort of perpetuates certain concentrations of wealth, uh, especially in like uh, microcredit institutions in the global south, uh, where it's sort of, uh, you know, 
perpetuated the debt economy among low income communities so it was uh, sort of jumping off that and wondering what you think about it Uh, well, I think Anand makes a lot of great points in his writings. Um, he's also just a great communicator, you know, able to uh, paint uh, issues in, in, you know, pretty clear terms and, and uh, uh, very engaging ways. Um, uh, you know, I think that he, one of the really central uh, arguments that he makes is that uh, there are a lot of very wealthy people right now who, who are alive today, who have created foundations and are therefore wielding uh, their personal influence uh, disproportionately um, and by setting up foundations and then you know having the foundations do things that kind of further their personal interests in it. It's very much in the, the realm of like uh, Rob Reich and Erica Cole Renas and you know, others who have written extensively about this time, Edgar Villanueva is another author who've you know, written about um, the kind of anti-democratic aspects of philanthropy. And I, again, I think a lot of those points are very valid. Um, for foundations like ours, and I'm just talking about CERDA and Ford at the moment, you know, we are legacy foundations. Um, and so it's a little different from, um, from you know, current big donors when you have people who are no longer related to the founders uh, running the place. And, um, you know, uh, but at the same time, you know, we've learned a lot of hard lessons and, and, you know, frankly, over the decades have, you know, demonstrated a lot of hubris in some of the work that we've done. Uh, and, uh, you know, foundation, there's such a wide variety of foundations out there that I think uh, it would be good for us to learn from these experiences, have some humility and, and recognize like what actually works in communities. If we truly want to empower communities to uh, have control and, and um, the ability to change uh, the destiny in their places, um, what really works? Is it, uh, it going to be like a national foundation flying in and dumping a bunch of money and then leaving after five years? Um, that's going to really make the difference? Or is it going to be uh, building the community capacity uh, and the strength of organizations in a more sustainable way? Um, so those are the types of things that, that I take uh, into the work that we try to do. If I what could just oh, uh, go ahead, Maria. Um, so I, you know, I think that this has been a time, uh, whether it's the past year or certainly the last years of, of increased scrutiny, where the philanthropy kind of at its own peril, you know, should not ignore um, critiques like the one that Anand has been. Um, has been describing, and I think he rightly roasts certain sectors um, of philanthropy for, um, in many ways, of, of course, being a creature of capitalism, and this, this, this contradiction, this tension that I know we all live with, of in many, being the product of a system that we're also trying to dismantle. So, like all of that is all of that is true, and we should be under scrutiny, and those questions should come. And I talk about philanthropy um, in general. I, I think it would be arrogant for us to think that we, as philanthropy, can take down those systems by ourselves, but we can certainly try, and try in a way, um, if um, with any luck, and where. The, the people who are working in philanthropy, the leadership of philanthropic organizations, the boards that govern them, not just resemble more and more um, uh, the diversity of the country in which we live in and the diversity of the communities we are trying to serve, but are, are living into those values. It, it, none of us are there yet. Um, and But I, 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 I personally think that it is that type of scrutiny and that type of questioning that allows us to um, not wring our hands or to engage in like self-flagellation all day long, but to actually do better and to um, uh, find ways to make the markets work harder for justice ultimately. Yeah, I'll just say that it's- um, Then just to- oh, Philanthropy is not- uh, Philanthropy is not uh, monolithic and modern philanthropy has definitely moved in, in the direction of vanity with a lot of these large foundations uh, being very much what Don described as, uh, you know, 
living donors making their own kinds of um, uh, ad hoc decisions about how money is, is being used. But um, even, even some of the more established philanthropy doing like, for example, uh, you mentioned microfinance work. Microfinance is really predicated on this odd notion that we just impose capitalist systems driven by debt to generate uh, entrepreneurial activity that will actually somehow confront poverty. There's been no evidence that microfinance actually reduces poverty. Um, and it certainly doesn't have any durable reduction in poverty. And it's no small wonder when you give people loans at interest rates of 30, 40, 60% annual rates uh, to go and you know, trade with each other. So um, you know, the, the irony of philanthropy is that it, it's created by inequality, right? The inequality is what actually made it possible to have philanthropy. And I guess it was Audrey Lord said that you can't dismantle a master's house using the master's tools or something, it's something of that effect. And here we are using the same tools that um, we're trying to confront if we're trying to take on the thing that we really need to take on, which is inequality of not just economic inequality, but power inequality in the world, right? I was just going to add the, the way that this plays out outside of the US is really important too, because you have in some places, even a more extreme version of of foundation structures that are linked to individuals or families who are very reluctant often to step outside of a purely charitable giving framework because they don't want to take on structures because they're in systems where their ability to survive relies on their maintaining good relationships with power holders. So they can't be critical of the state. And so things that the Ford Foundation has done in various places like the Middle East has been to be part of efforts to professionalize a sector in ways that then can pull out interventions that are not on their face confrontational, but still address some of these drivers of inequality and what like in a, in a particular context. Great. Well, I think we're at time here. And uh, so I just want to say to all four of our panelists uh, on behalf of Columbia GSAP and the urban planning program in particular, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to, to share some thoughts with us today. And uh, it was a very dynamic conversation and great engagement. So thank you all so much. Uh, this will be recorded and on the GSAP website. And uh, there won't be a lecture series next week because it's election day. Uh, everyone, please make sure to vote. Uh, if you're able, and um, hopefully um, we will see some change for the better next week and uh, see everyone on November 10th. Thanks, Thank you all. Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you.